Okay, this is Lauren's first plane ride right here. We was raised in a very rural area of North Carolina where there was holly jobs or any work and the only form of work that was there was farming. We used to go and pick cotton or potatoes or beans or something like that. Instead of us being in school, sometimes we had to be in the field. I remember, um, you know, my hair was unkempt. You know, I used to wear the same thing over and over and over to school at least three times a week. You know, I was really an unkempt little girl. Like many people growing up in North Carolina in the 50s and 60s, Elaine Riddick Jesse never had the real opportunity she'd been guaranteed as an American citizen. Her fate was bound up with a state built on a system of segregation and Jim Crow laws. The Windfall community suffered in extreme poverty. Elaine watched her parents' marriage fall apart, eventually leading social workers to send her to live with her grandmother. Then, Elaine's life took another tragic turn. I was a victim of rape. I was molested when I was 13 years old. And the guy that raped me told me if I told anybody that he was going to kill me. You know, and um, so I had to keep it to myself. Eventually, the social worker noticed that Elaine was pregnant, assumed that she was promiscuous, and recommended that Elaine be examined by the state eugenics board. The eugenics board was a board of five men that sat around a table, and of course, they were white men, too. They sat around a table, and they just marked the paper. Anybody that the, that the social worker would deem feeble-minded or slow or having a problem, the social worker would come in and say, I want this person sterilized. And boom, they stamped it, and that was it. The board was presented with an evaluation from the social worker who insisted that there was no hope for Elaine, that she got along poorly with other children, and that an IQ test showed that she was feeble-minded. No one asked me, what's wrong? Can I help you? Are you hungry? Are you cold? You know, maybe I'm sick. No one took the time to find out what was the problem. Elaine discovered the board had completely ignored another evaluation they received by a psychologist who said her chief problem was her environment. She was doing above average work in school, and any difficulty she had getting along with others was likely due to the fact that she was always being bullied by other students and was generally hungry. The board favored the social worker's recommendation. I had my son, and I woke up in bandages, not knowing what it was for. They went inside of me and sterilized me without my knowledge, because I was black, poor, and my mother was in a prison. My dad was running around. He was an alcoholic. My mother was an alcoholic. So they automatically assumed that I was going to become an alcoholic. And then, without even my son as a baby, automatically assuming that he was the third generation and that he was going to be an alcoholic also. What they wanted to do was nip it in the bud right then. Stop this family tree. They want to cut the tree down. And I want to know who in the world give these people the right to go and do these sort of things to another human being. The wealthiest families in the country provided millions in research funding to scientists in an attempt to prove that social problems were primarily a result of defective genetics. At the prestigious Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York, Harry Laughlin, an animal breeder, directed the eugenics record office. He claimed they could predict who would inherit good or bad traits by using a mathematical formula from Mendel. They were also firm believers in Charles Darwin, who clearly applied his theory of natural selection to human society. Eugenicists saw themselves as agents of evolution, doing their duty to ensure that the fittest Americans survived. They said, we have to find a way to have people who are more evolved make more babies. We have to find a way to have people who are poor 
and we have all these diseases and all this bad genetic structure produce less. Biologist Harry Laughlin wrote the model law that North Carolina eventually used to sterilize Elaine Riddick. He called for millions of people he considered defective to be forcibly sterilized, as well as relatives who might be carrying supposed recessive genes for inferior traits. In 1927, the Supreme Court upheld Harry Laughlin's model law and ruled eight to one that the Constitution permitted U.S. citizens to be forcibly sterilized. Congress never passed a federal sterilization law. But it's estimated that by the end of World War II, under state laws, at least 80,000 Americans had been forced to undergo hysterectomies, tubal ligation, vasectomies, and castration. Next, North Carolina moves toward compensating victims of a sterilization program that lasted more than four decades. Ray Suarez has the story. North Carolina was by no means the only state to have people sterilized against their will, but it was among the most aggressive in pursuing the policy. Roughly 7,600 people were sterilized between 1929 and 1974, many of them poor, sick, uneducated, or institutionalized, sometimes through force and coercion. The vast majority of the procedures took place in the years after World War II, when other states pulled back from such programs. The state apologized for the offenses in 2002. Today, a task force voted to pay the remaining living victims $50,000 apiece. We look at the history and today's decision with one of the principal activists working with the state's task force. Charmaine Fuller Cooper is the executive director of the State Foundation for Victims of Sterilization. Welcome to the program. How did North Carolina first get involved in sterilizing people? North Carolina first became involved in the whole sterilization procedure at the height of eugenics in America. At the height of eugenics, we had approximately over 30 states that had sterilization programs or laws, with Indiana being the first state. Ironically, North Carolina actually didn't sterilize as many people in the early years like other states, but after World War II, North Carolina became very aggressive. But after World War II, eugenics, that is, keeping people who are judged to be inferior from having children, was thoroughly discredited. How come North Carolina continued with the program for almost 30 years? You know, it's very unexplainable in North Carolina why our program continued for another 30 years after other states had pretty much dismantled their program. And it's very horrifying and very shocking. And that's one of the reasons why North Carolina's governor and other people in the state are really working to, to gain justice for victims now. Beyond simply apologizing, beyond the payment, has this case reopened a conversation in North Carolina about the conditions that allowed this kind of thing to happen? You know, that has been part of the conversation, but it's certainly at the beginning stages to looking at how did this happen in the first place? What happened with eugenics? And this also occurred during a time when the Great Depression had just ended in the United States, and a lot of people never recovered after the Great Depression, but for many states, eugenics was a solution um, for poverty. I would say our biggest risk that we took was stepping into this contraceptive space. Uh, because of intense political pressure in the United States and some religious pressure, the global health community had backed off on contraceptives. And in 2012, we led an initiative and stepped back in because it is the greatest anti-poverty tool in the world. Say.